Hello, my name is Daniel Thacker, and, and this, this is, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and this is Gail Biddle. We are interviewing C. David Kimmel for our first interview in a new series titled The Penn State Altoona Oral History Project, where the Robert E. Ica Library will be collecting oral histories with students, employees, alumni, and people of the community who help build Penn State Altoona. And Dave fits, uh, he fits all these all these categories. Um, today, we'll be focusing on Dave's years as a student, and he was a student here at Penn State Altoona from 1958 to 1960. Today's date is Tuesday, January 26, 2021, and we'll be talking about Dave's uh, time as a student here, and we'll also be going through his scrapbook that he compiled as a student. And uh, Gail and I will be making a video with this interview and corresponding pictures, documents, and newspaper clippings from uh, his scrapbook and, and other archive holdings, uh, which Dave was responsible for uh, obtaining, will, will be used uh, in, in making of the video. And this will be on Penn State Altoona's YouTube channel. Or if you can't find it, you can always contact the Robert E. Ica Library. Thank you very much for being here, Dave. Thank, thank you. you. It's a privilege. Yeah, it's going to no. be fun. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, when and how did you first choose Penn State Altoona? Well, that's a very interesting story, just in itself. Um, when I was in high school, I was very involved in the early years of television. I mean, the school districts didn't have TV stations as today, and uh, but we worked at Altoona High School with the local TV station and did a once-a-week production. And uh, I was involved as one of the student producers of that and really got involved in I ah, this is what I want to do. I want to be in TV. So uh, during my senior year, I actually wasn't thinking of Penn State Altoona at the time uh, because that wasn't available uh, as a major or uh, even a minor. So I was looking at a TV school in Washington, D.C. Well, my parents and myself, we went down to, to visit and... Uh, and the way back, I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm headed, I think, to Penn State Altoona. So it was just one of those disappointments where it wasn't what we had hoped and I had hoped for. Uh, so actually, classes had started, or there were registration had started at Penn State Altoona, but Dean uh, of Student Affairs, Steve Adler, who was also the registrar, made sure that I got in and everything was done in an expeditious manner and started my career then then out to the campus as it was called uh, so that's how i ended up here um, but also had always had that flair for production and as i did in high school too for never on stage but production side of everything so uh, which happened a good deal here too in my two years here also so so that's how i ended up at Penn State Altoona. Did, did you go to high school here in Altoona? I was a uh, graduate of Altoona High, what was then called Altoona High School, Altoona class of 1958. 1958. Yeah, yeah. That was a small class also because we were born in 40, just as the outbreak of World War II, and uh, men were being, of course, we were going to service left and right. There weren't too many babies born. So we were one in 1940. So we were one of the smallest classes. Altoona was graduating around 11 to 1200 a year and our class I think was 654 around that figure so when we graduated so we were because of the when we were born it was a small class and then it jumped back up again okay uh, after those years but so that made for an interesting high school class too yeah well we saw that the um, the official student uh, directory count for the fall semester of 1958 yeah. was around 400. That, that was how many students were on the campus at that time? Yes, and that, that one included those uh, associate degree programs were very big uh, at that time, the two-year associate degree programs, particularly in engineering, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering, what was called drafting the design technology. So they were big uh, and attracted a lot of people from the all well, three to four counties uh, around Blair County, and then, uh, and then the baccalaureate students. So... Um, not sure anymore what the breakdown was between the associate degree students and baccalaureate, but it probably could have been at those in those years about 50-50 uh, then. So it was a 
it was an interesting mix uh, of people um, because of it was a lot of, again was engineering which today we have a lot of engineering majors uh, so it's it's always thought about that that uh, we've always been that's been part of our history really is the engineering programs but uh, we did start in the bathhouse uh, because the E. Raymond Smith building, uh, there was a campaign in Altoona, Blair County to raise funds for a new classroom building because we were still currently using all the, the amusement park uh, buildings. Uh, and it was, it was a little behind schedule, so it wasn't totally completed for the first day of classes. So we did meet for several days in the bathhouse. So that's great to, to have a part of your history. Uh, and then we were asked uh, during those several days, would we help so that we could get in the building faster and have our classes there, would we volunteer as students to help unpack the desks, the chairs for the classrooms, the offices, the lounges? And we did. Well, a lot of us did. Uh, so that made it go a little bit faster, and we had a lot of fun doing it. And it made you feel like, okay, you're a part of this. Uh, so that was... Uh, a very interesting part of moving out of the bathhouse and and then going into a brand new building which we thought wow this is wonderful you know what, what more could happen here you know so we thought we had it all just in that one building uh, and then I always say what happened what has happened today that uh, where we are today it's just it's amazing it's amazing so but we were uh, so we were actually then the first class in the E. Raymond Smithville and those people who enrolled in 1958. Um, so at the, during the dedication of the building, uh, Bob Eichhoff was always one and Steve Adler, again, the Dean of Student Affairs to involve students. So we were all involved in that and all invited to it. And uh, because of the uniqueness of it, uh, I think we were among one of the first campuses to go into a community and ask for funds to help support higher ed uh, in the community. So Dr. Walker, who was then the president, Eric Walker, who was president of the university at the time, of course, was here and took part in the, uh, the dedication of the Smith Building. And in our archives, we still have the original program, dedication program from uh, that dedication. And again, the, the E. Raymond Smith, name comes from the founder and owner of the amusement park, Iowa Side Amusement Park. Um, we have several Smiths. We have the Robert Smith building on campus, but uh, there, there, there's uh, no direct relation there. But E. Raymond was the pharmacist who uh, gave the advisory board a very good price to help establish the college here. You know, when you think back to there was a lot of foresight in the part of the uh, advisory board at that time, which uh, Ted Holzner was chairing, um, to look at this property, uh, which if you look at photos of those post days of the park, the buildings weren't in the best of shape. Uh, so, but they had, they could see the future. Uh, and to think about that, they took a bathhouse, a huge bathhouse that, uh, handled over 10,000 people sometimes on a weekend and convert it into classrooms and offices. Uh, and then to take the old roller skating rink and convert it into the first class or first student union uh, and a couple of the other buildings. Uh, tremendous amount of foresight. Uh, and often alums from Mac that era will talk about the, the interesting times they had in the buildings. Was, was the roller rink was that in Ivy Hall? That was Ivy Hall. Ivy Hall. That would be named Ivy Hall. Then. Okay. Yeah. So it was the roller skating rink and dance hall at the park. Uh, and then that became our, our student union. And some of the students who attended both of their years in bathhouse had the great stories about the skunks that sometimes would enter under the building and the building would have to be evacuated for a short while uh, until things got a little better. Uh, so... There's interesting stories along those lines, too, of uh, those days. And again, of course, the parking lot, which was the pool, um, it was crumbling, uh, but still satisfactory, the, the concrete. Uh, and 
all they did was take out a corner of the pool that we could pull down into park. Uh, it was a little rough in the winter because it was kind of tough to plow, plow that in the winter. Uh, so it wasn't done that often. Uh, but that became our parking lot. And today that's the same place that's the parking lot next to Michonne. And, and I understand that it was built to be the same size as the pool was, uh, the original pool. Uh, so those uh, types of things are that alums love to talk about when they get together and uh, talk about those days. And, and again, it was called, got that nickname, Bathhouse U, uh, which was, you know, I'll turn undergraduate center was the official name at the, at the time the college started, but when they moved here, from downtown Webster building, uh, people started calling it Bad House U, and that has stuck uh, over a number of years. Did they also call it Holtzinger's Folly there for a while? I, that's what I read. Well, I, that I think was, I don't think that was a common name. That okay. was with some people thinking, oh, what, what are they thinking? And here are these guys that had this great foresight, you know, to, to do this. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's, you know, it's something I think that people... I thought, well, what? Why are they doing this? You know, what's there? Um, well, the so from nineteen thirty nine is when they started until fifty eight. So uh, twenty years before they were able to get the their first building. But but yeah. once they started, they really started. But was that that E Raymond? That that was all funds from the community. That wasn't from Penn State University. That was all funds from the community. Right. Yes. There was no university or state funds involved in that. Um, so it was a building that was to get as much as possible out of it. It was a, a very simple building um, because the building has been renovated. I don't know how many times since then. Uh, but it was very the, the windows were of course no air conditioning back then. Uh, central air, but but the windows were single pane um, and large because it was more economical to do large glass windows than a lot of brick. Uh, so the the classrooms could be a little drafty uh, in the winters, uh, but it, it if we were just so happy, so happy to have that uh, type of facility to do. And we loved the, the student union, the old Ivy Hall. Um, it was named Ivy Hall a little bit later, but when we were students here, it was uh, just the student union. And that's where the theatrical shows would go on, that the drama department would do. That's where our dances were. Dances were popular back then, weekend activities uh, such as dances. Uh, a couple of years we had a Bozo, it was called a Beaux Arts Ball, uh, that was really unique, uh, total weekend of the arts, and also a big dance. Um, and that's where the bookstore was. The bookstore was a one room with a counter. <laughs> you just walked up the counter, very limited as far as what you got your textbooks there. It might be a few other items, but that was it. So, and that was also the dining hall. And the back of the building, there was a small kitchen with a, a food service line, and uh, they served the breakfast and lunch uh, during those days. So, of course, again, we had no residence halls at the time, so there was no dinner. Uh, menu, but uh, we we had sufficient sufficient food service back then. So you were the first class to actually be in the E Raymond building. Yes, right. yes, yeah. That all that five four hundred and twenty five of us. Yeah. Uh, uh, during that time, but and then that class that well, some of those students when the graduation came for in nineteen sixty or nineteen fifty nine. Uh, that would have com uh, com been comprised of students who spent their first year in the bathhouse and then their second year uh, in Smith Billing. And then, and then you saw the bathhouse demolished. That happened yes. in '59. Yes, that was uh, that was it was sad, but uh, we knew that it had to go. Uh, but it was uh, still, and it didn't take them much to take it down, uh, but. Again, it's all wood, uh, so there would be no way today that a public institution could have such a facility uh, for classes. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of photos of that coming down, and again, it was a great part of history because of the park itself. Yeah. But we still had we had the pine and the elm building, 
and then the Ivy Ivy Hall, and then and then the E Raymond building. Were those at around fifty eight fifty nine? Were those the the main buildings that were being used? They were the only buildings. The only buildings. <laughs> okay, they were the only buildings. <laughs> okay. Yes, we didn't have anything else, uh, so we made do. We made do. You you mentioned. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You you mentioned that Robert Ica wanted to include the students. Um, did 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 you when, when did you first start to have a, a relationship with Robert? Well, uh, back in those days, everybody knew everyone. I mean, the staff was small, the faculty was small, so you really it was almost one on one right away. Uh, Bob Ica and Steve Adler would be with the students, and uh, so it it made it much easier. But then. Uh, Having been involved in high school and, and activities, well, I, of course, naturally couldn't resist getting involved here. So even my freshman year, we were involved in a number of different things, uh, including Ivy side players and uh, getting things going as far as the social activities, uh, because we thought it was important that we had some social activities since there wasn't much more. Uh, and and that, really, that really, with those types of activities, were very helpful. Did, did you create the Ivy Side players, or did you? No, no, no. Ivy Side players had existed prior. To, yeah, and I saw that you were the pr- production manager for a couple productions, not all, all not all of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but you you were behind the scenes helping pr- produce them. Yes, I again, I'm not a stage type person. I I like the production end of it. I've done a couple minuscule type of roles in the shows, uh, but. No, I like the, the production. I guess that was from my background, the early years, of my interest in television. But uh, that that really led to uh, helping with the uh, the productions, and we always had you know a great deal of fun with it. Later on, when I was on staff here, my first tenure, uh, they produced um, Fantastic, the Fantastics, and the drama coach at the time asked me to play the role of one of the fathers. There were two fathers, so I actually. That was my really only time of doing a, a role, uh, active active role on stage, uh, and that was quite experienced. And that was the show that we literally took on the road. Uh, we took it to University Park. We performed in the theater uh, Pavilion Theater at University Park. We performed at Du Bois Campus. So we, we thought we were just something special that we were on the road with Fantastics. It was a great cast, uh, wonderful people. Uh, that were involved, and there were, um, in fact, uh, Alice Goodfellow, who was the uh, wife of Dr. Good, Lewis Goodfellow, who was the, one of the professors of psychology, was the pianist uh, for that production. And uh, so, and then Mary Lauber, uh, who was a very accomplished harpist in town, uh, volunteered to be the harpist. So we had drums, harpist, and piano, and basically that's the original Fantastics. Is how it operated with uh, musical accompaniment, and in that time we performed in the Slep Center. Uh, that's where theater productions would take place before we had a theater. Yeah. So that, that's jumping ahead, but that just you know, to say that's about the only time we ever <laughs> ever appeared on campus. Well, I was thinking of a um, there was a story that we read. Um, it, it was when funds for the E. Raymond Smith Building was stalling out, and and students. Or it was going door to door, um, and 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 they are into businesses too. And they went to a music store, and they they came out with a piano. Was that true, or yes? But that was before my time. Before your that, time, that that okay. was when their students were raising. I was still in high school. Okay, but that's when they were raising, going out and helping, because a lot of that was done. That initial uh, monies for the Smith Building was done. So a lot of it was done door to door. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, you obviously, there obviously was a lot of community support. I mean, monetarily, but also um, physically as well. Yes, and then, you know, there again back in those days, there weren't major gifts. There were a lot of smaller gifts um, because again, the college was so young, and people were learning really about the true value of having higher ed in their community. And um, it was a time that just wasn't a great deal of wealth. Uh, so I, I think it's all all the more important that there was a great deal of, of support from throughout the community, even those door-to-door 
you would never think about that today as far as the capital gifts. You don't, you just don't do that. But, but that's, uh, everybody was so dedicated to making sure that this community had an institution of higher learning. So they were doing just about anything and everything they could uh, do to help with that. Yeah. Yeah. We found in the um, the Antonio era there was actually kind of almost like a coupon where yes. you could say, you know, I'm I'm going to volunteer to do this. I'll even bring my own tools yeah. and, and things like that in order to, to help yeah. build. Yeah. yeah. Well, renovate back in those days. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's it's been that that's been a great advantage of Penn State Altoona is the strong strong community support that. Even today, uh, I think rivals among the campuses uh, about the strong community support we have here. Yeah. So when when you helped unpack all the desks, was that an official work day or was that? No, work days were uh, something separate. Uh, that was a traditional thing back in those days uh, where uh, I'm not much sure who started, whether it was Steve Adder's idea or Bob Ica's, but the idea is we had a day off from classes. Uh, so you didn't have to volunteer, but a lot of students did. Uh, and there would be projects. And so when you would arrive, you'd be assigned to a crew. Uh, and but mostly, of it, a lot of it was working outside, clearing brush, uh, cutting down trees. So here we are, freshmen and sophomores with chainsaws, and everything else that you could never, ever do today. But it was, I mean, and then there was one part of it called Carney's Wall on the stream that runs down through campus that the wall uh, it was in a sharp edge and an angle that would keep flooding out. So Dr. Albert Carney chaired that project uh, and led it and uh, would work with a group of students. And so it actually became known as Carney's Wall. Uh, during those years. So it was just projects like that. It would be picked up on that project was picked up every year uh, to work, enhance it and, and build it a little bit longer uh, down on the stream side. So uh, it, it, it was just a lot of fun. A hard day uh, and then we were provided lunch uh, and then we just had a great time working and a lot of things. One of the first uh, athletic fields was cleared by a group of students to make that all possible. Uh, so, and of course, and actually, the facility staff, which again was small then, worked directly with us. And again, a number of the staff and faculty, like Dr. Carney and uh, and Bob Ica would always be out there, and Steve Adler. But um, so there was a true family, true family, and that that was very unique, very different. But people have a lot of good memories about the work days. So. And there's good things in the archives. Uh, anybody wants to ever look into the uh, archives of Penn State Altoona, there's uh, interesting materials and photos in the archives about uh, our work days. There was also, um, there's a lot of pictures of, um, it's like rag drives. It was, I, I, uh, I remember them filling up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, was during yeah. the, that was during the war in those early years when right. they were downtown. Uh, just uh, anything because they were, they were a desperate need so there were those drives uh, to help uh, get that stuff for the war uh, but that was students I think and staff coming together but that that that, that happened in the days of the Webster building downtown yeah. yeah so again it's always been a, a lot of close affiliation and association with students and students talk about that today constantly about the interaction with faculty and staff, and it's fortunately it's always been a part of Penn State Altoona. Because I'll, because okay, so the, we were downtown from thirty nine, and then forty seven, forty eight was when we moved officially to Ivy. Yes, Side. yes, okay, yes. Uh, so it was, and again downtown, it was in one building, and then across maybe six blocks and across the railroad tracks was the second building. Uh, and again, it was a second abandoned elementary classroom building. Uh, and uh, so students joked back then uh, about going to two different locations as Penn State Altoona today is two locations at Ivy's High Park and now downtown again. So we're back to uh, where we were. But uh, I guess the schedules ran fairly close that people would really, and there weren't that many cars, I guess, 
that students had then, so they'd really have to beat their butts across the Seventh Street Bridge to get from Webster School to Madison School for classes. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, alums back in those days that were had great stories about that. So some of the labs, chemistry labs and others, I guess, were located in Madison. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it, it made, a, uh, as I always think about when we're such have a strong presence downtown today, what it was from the very beginning. Uh, so it's almost full circle uh, again along those lines. Well, you know, if you were saying about, you know, obviously with such a small, small group of people, yeah. it was very much like a family. Um, but, and, and at the time, the ratio of male to female students was 11 to 1. <laughs> so were the female students, um, was it seen as something unusual or were they very supported? Um, was it encouraged? Yeah, them? I think it was very supportive. We, again, there was just, uh, there was a uniqueness, I think, back in those days as far as helping each other and and we had two of those uh, females uh, that were older in their 50s uh, and they were just kind of like our mothers Mildred Moses and um, I knew I forget the second name uh, but they were phenomenal uh, they were just uh, they got along with us you know it was just like they were of one of us and they were they were full-time students uh, so Back then, we had the, the seniors uh, enrolled in classes, but they were the only two. Uh, but uh, we have great memories of sitting in the, uh, the initial lobby of the Ingram and Smith building. It was kind of like the hangout other than the uh, student union building. Uh, but uh, great conversations took place there, and a lot of ideas would come forth from just sitting there and chatting. Uh, but it, it, it was just very unique and having those two ladies uh, but and again I think it was back in those days that in the associate degree programs that we had one female enrolled and uh, she went on to be Miss Central Pennsylvania uh, at the time uh, remember that uh, distinctly so she had uh, quite the honors uh, uh, based on her during her time here so in 1958, not not everybody was going to college, you know, like they are in 2021. About about how many people went to college in in your class? Do you do you have a rough idea? I don't. I really don't know what that percentage back then. I'm sure it's greater today um, than it was then, uh, because again, back and even back in 1958, Pennsylvania Railroad was still fairly strong and had uh, a lot of high paying well-paying jobs. Uh, so for a lot of young men uh, coming out of high school, there were, there were opportunities there. That was probably the major opportunity uh, because it was in those early days that the Pennsylvania Railroad employed 17,000 people right here in Altoona. Uh, so that was the, the mainstay of the community and it kept everything going. So there were there was opportunities there, but then there were special needs that they had and that the government had for training uh, needs that helped Penn State Altoona, the Altoona Undergraduate Center then, that would Webster stay alive because those programs were ones that were desperately needed for the railroad uh, as they shipped kind of retool to fit the needs of the, uh, of the war and also the government itself. So. Uh, those certificate programs were very valuable in, in helping, uh, too. And back in those days, too, there was a severe need for students, and so they recruited females, particularly, because all the men were being drafted into the service. So, uh, And there's all kinds of stories about that we can talk about some other time, but, uh, but there's wonderful experiences then, too. There at the, the Annie C. Wolf Women's Dormitory. Yes, yes, yes. How the advisory board once again stepped up, bought a house, big house, Annie Wolf's house, converted it into a women's residence hall. Yep. They did Dormitory, that. Dormitory, as they call it then. They did that from 44 to 47? I think that's the case, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was just right then when there was that desperate need in order to, to maintain, the, hopefully, keep the college open. Yeah. yeah. 
And they did it. Yes, they did. Yeah, they did it. Everything that they, again, you just can't underestimate the value of what the community and the members of the community have done for this college. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. But then uh, the other thing that was interesting too was the tuition uh, was so very different. Now, two hundred fifty dollars. Now, when people say two hundred fifty dollars for a semester, two hundred fifty. Well, that was that was a good deal of money uh, back in those days. Uh, so you, you have to. I don't know what the equation would be to, uh, to compare it to today, but of course we're into thousands today. Uh, but yes, it was 250 and, and that was just, of course, tuition since there wasn't any room and board uh, available. So uh, that made it much easier for people locally. And a, a great deal of emphasis was put on because of the tremendous support of the community. Uh, a lot of emphasis was put on making sure that local students got enrolled, who wanted to be enrolled. Uh, there were probably exceptions made then that it would uh, today that would just wouldn't be made, but uh, it was the idea to help the community uh, and the community that helped the college. Uh, so, and that of course helped with enrollment too. And and when did it change from the Altoona Undergraduate Center to Penn State Altoona? Well, it went through a couple different. Uh, it was the. Uh, Altoona Undergraduate Center, and then just strictly became Altoona Campus uh, before it officially became uh, Penn State Altoona. I did have that date at one time when it officially became Penn State Altoona. Um, I'm not sure when, but uh, those. But back in my days, uh, by the time we started here in '58, here on on Ivy Side, it was Altoona Campus, uh, but but the, the, not the Penn State Altoona. And a lot of people, um, as we know, today in this community will still refer to it sometimes as the Undergraduate Center, up at the Altoona Undergraduate Center, or at AUC. Another act was AUC. Uh, and of course, Bathhouse U was a nickname uh, It was used more, but more in chess. But, uh, but I still hear people in the community say AUC, uh, that that was part of the culture back then. And a lot of people, instead of calling it, we're truly a college today, but some people still, because of that old Penn State and Altoona campus uh, name, people just say the campus. And I say it's a college. Yes, <laughs> it's a college. Back at the college. Uh, on campus, but back at the college. Uh, so it's, again, that culture change that people go through when there's names and growth. And fortunately, we've gone that uh, the positive way in regards to change. Uh, and not in the negative side of things. Uh, so, but I got involved in my years here uh, with the idea of, okay, what can we do? And, and got elected as president of the Student Government Association. Uh, and we had a small group. Uh, I know there's photos somewhere, but we uh, had a very active group. And we were, we were in charge of everything. Um, we, we were given X number of dollars by student affairs to run activities, and we, we, we could request additional stipends if needed, uh, but we worked with that budget to, to do everything possible, all the extracurricular activities. We allocated monies to Ivy Side players, uh, to clubs that there were existing at that time for a small amount to help them with their activities, and of course the, the social activity so um, and we work closely with uh, with the the college in uh, whatever we could do to help with the growth of it uh, which during the uh, sophomore year of our time here uh, is when they were in the midst of a capital gifts campaign for this slept student center in the first residence hall uh, and again that was a community capital gifts campaign some of those funds did come from the, uh, the university because the university helps to support the construction of residence halls. Uh, so we thought, well, how could we help? Uh, and so uh, back in those days, we had what was called an assessment fee, a whopping $25. And if you were good, 
during your four years and didn't cause any damage or anything anywhere, you got that back. So uh, upon graduation or when you left the university. So we petitioned, we took the idea to uh, uh, Dean Adler, and then we petitioned the University Park about what could we perhaps pledge that uh, back to the university so that when we graduated, Instead of getting that $25, it would go back to the university for buildings. And that was eventually approved at University Park. Uh, and so we had a campaign here. And then when we went up to University Park in our junior years, we continued that. And uh, we had a big event up there that some of the officials from here came. And the director of uh, development of the university was there, in fact, helped to set it up. We had a big dinner in the Hetzel Union building, and we had additional commitments made by students. Uh, so back in those days, we were already involved with helping to, to, to build the, the college. So that was unique, and we, we had a good time doing it. So we had a pledge card. We had to sign it, and of course, that was given over to the university, and, and those monies then were eventually given to the uh, Penn State Altoona. Do you know how much money you rose, you raised? I think that's probably somewhere in the archives. That's okay. one uh, figure I don't have. I don't think it was a huge amount. It was a couple thousand because we didn't have, again, that enrollment uh, as much as we had uh, today. So, But I honestly think that that was the beginning of uh, a major class gift program that the university started. I don't think there was too much emphasis put on class gift. Uh, gifts at that time, and that uh, it was an idea, and so I'm not sure at University Park then after that whether they can they picked up on that or not, but uh, we felt good about doing it. Yeah. So I would think that like that like that was a sort of thing that Robert Ica and Adler and Smith would have taken note of. Is that kind of how you got possibly the attention to and then to be asked? For employment after you, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I would think so. Well, yeah, it truly was uh, because we continued that at University Park, and of course, my total involvement here and uh, was I was admitted into graduate school, and um, I was in the College of Education at the time, and I entered graduate school in higher ed, and my thought was I was either going to go continue on higher ed or teach. Uh, until Bob Ica came uh, during uh, my first semester in graduate school and said he has this idea that he would like to have a position at Altoona that would be in charge of development and public relations, alumni relations, and stewardship, and uh, we'd like you to consider it. Uh, so I left graduate school after first semester and started here in January of 19. Uh, 64. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry, January 1963. Uh, so, for the next uh, 15 years, uh, we started building a program here in all those areas. So, that's how I got here. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what sports, if any, were important on campus when you were a student? Well, it was interesting back in those days, and actually, I think the college can be very, and the athletic program can be very proud that baseball started the very first year uh, at uh, down at Webster. Um, and by the time we were up here, the two main sports were basketball and baseball. Um, and because they were easier, they didn't require a lot of equipment, um, we played our games. Back in my days, in the 58 to 60, we either played at Keith Junior High School gym or the YMCA. Um, both were not the best uh, floors for collegiate ball, but that's that's what we had. And uh, so we would travel once again from campus and I was high downtown uh, or across town for, for games. So, uh, but they were popular and we had some great players. Um, back in those days, too, in those early days. So, and again, as it does today, it gives students an opportunity who are very good in particular sports that perhaps can't play uh, Division One and NCAA, but they have that opportunity here. So 
there were a lot of very, very good players back then, and we had a lot of fun doing it. And the one year, I ended up helping Dean Adler was the uh, coach at the time and uh, helped him. And so it was kind of officially, unofficially known as the, the basketball manager. <laughs> and I have a jacket to prove it <laughs> that's in the archive. So it was good times. And it was back in those days, too, that, well, because of Ted Holsinger, chair of the advisory board, was also the general manager and president of the Altoona Mirror, we got the best coverage that anybody could ever ask for. We, we never had the question. It was there. We had good coverage of everything we did, in particular the sports. So fortunately, because of that, there's good records in the archives about uh, uh, some of the things we, we accomplished during those times. And basically, back in those days, we played the other Commonwealth campuses. It wasn't like it is today. Uh, but And then junior colleges, too. Uh, so there was a junior college conference and then the campuses. So it helped it helped to build a program. There was I, I saw it in the in the scrapbooks and um, it was Potomac. Was that a big rival? Potomac State. Okay. Potomac State. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I that, that that clip I saw that several times, yeah. Potomac. Um, yeah. Um in Maryland, I think. I think okay. In Maryland, but Potomac State, yeah, I remember that well. Yeah. Uh, and then one of, one of the other uh, uh, rivals has always been the Barron, Penn State, uh, Erie. Uh, Barron has been a rival even back in those days, and it continues to be today because we're all in Division Three of NCAA. But uh, so they were some of the big rivals. Yeah, yeah. And we won uh, uh, Central when I was the manager, quote unquote. Uh, we we won the. Western Division of the Commonwealth Campus uh, uh, tournament. So uh, that's how we got our jackets. Uh, Dean Adler was very, and again, there was no athletic department. There was no athletic director. Again, Steve Adler, Dean of Student Affairs, registrar, did a, you know, so there there was that that love and, and, and dedication to try to make things go as far as helping to build a college. Uh, so People back in those days did much more than what it would ever be expected today. Um, but they, they all had a dear, a great love for it, including Bob Smith, uh, who was the fiscal manager, business manager called that, that at that time. Um, so, and actually, when you think back, Bob Smith, this must have been the thinking of the university, uh, Bob Smith was the very first employee before even bringing on the director, Bob Ica. Uh, so he was in place back in 1947 before uh, we brought on Bob Ica. Uh, I mean, 1939. 39. 1939. So, uh, so those three were very instrumental in a lot of things. But then again, uh, you, I can't overlook the dedication of faculty uh, back in those days, faculty and administration. It was just uh, very, very very unique, and, and uh, I don't honestly think we'd be where we are today without the foresight of some of those people and leadership in the community. Yeah. In, in your scrapbook, there was some, some faculty in there. Um, one of it was an art teacher, and Fulbright Award winner, Christian Hewitt. He wasn't an art teacher, he was English. English, he okay, was English. thank you. Uh, and actually, I had the good opportunity of having him. Um, an awesome individual, um, very personal, but you could just sit and listen to him. I mean, he was just that type of, uh, uh, professor, um, very intelligent, um, again, was great with students. Uh, and I, I'll tell you what, I was petrified in his classes because I wanted to make sure that my theme papers were to the best it could be. I did think, I think I come out of a B in there. I wasn't always the best student, but I think I come out of that class in a B, which I felt very happy about. But again, he was, he was among some of the unique professors back in those earlier days that, uh, that we were able to have here at, at Altoona. But he was a great person. And then the Zollers, uh, there were two, was prof uh, husband and wife, uh, Ed Zoller, and Dr. Lucille Zoller, uh, they were actually here prior to my time as a student. 
uh, they had retired, but I knew them and then continued a very strong relationship with them in the years after uh, with them. There, again, were among some of the best. They were totally involved with, with students at the time. Uh, well known, uh, Ed Zola's work. Uh, there's, a, there's a museum at University Park named after him. Uh, we have a lot of his artwork that's been donated uh, on campus. And in fact, in my own, uh, his pieces would be donated to the college. Uh, and I have some of his very early works, uh, which would be a nice addition to the uh, permanent art collection here. But uh, Dr. Zoller, uh, she taught theater and she taught English and she did some of the uh, uh, theater productions. But uh, Dr. Ed or Ed Zoller passed away, oh, I think when I started here my first tenure uh, of employment. And so there were a group of individuals, uh, Kay Parks, who taught English, who, uh, Lisa Marshall taught English, um, Joy Skip taught drama and theater, uh, Robin Ike, who taught English, and myself, kind of became their family. Uh, we were kind of adopted by the two of them before Ed passed away. So we spent a great deal of time with them, and also with Lucille, uh, up until her passing. Uh, also, but it was uh, again a, a great experience. They lived up at Hundred Springs outside Tyrone, a very unique house where Ed had a studio. Lucille was also into pottery and jewelry. She had a special hut for that. So for for me, in particular, I was the youngest of that that family group. Uh, unique experience to be with people like that, and we'd be there often for dinner and up there on weekends, and and uh, so. Uh, that added so much more to my um, experience uh, as a young person and growing and having that exposure to people like that. But both of them had phenomenal backgrounds, uh, well known, and it's just it's so nice to, to be visit the Zoller Gallery. Uh, but today here, uh, his works are throughout both campuses, um, so a downtown campus and here. So it's always nice to. Uh, see their pieces. He also wrote a book, and we'll put a link in the description uh, to that book yeah. um, that had his artwork, and he talked about yes, his yes. thoughts and how he came about it, and how he needed to do art. Do we have a copy of that? Do you know? In the uh, library? I have a copy. We we, we have Which we have the, give? The, the the digital copy. We we don't oh, have the physical oh. book here. Okay. Well, we got to make sure that happens. Uh, so. well, <laughs> his um. Uh, I think they, they called it abstract expressionism. Um, yes. Very, uh, what I saw was very uh, muted colors uh, of like whites and grays. Well, he started out um, early in his work with uh, still life uh, scenes, uh, community and so forth. Uh, and then during his progression, you saw they became a little uh, more of the grays and not the bright colors. Uh, and unfortunately, I have pieces back in those days. And then he became very abstract. And that's what his became known for. Uh, I can remember there was an exhibit, a one-man exhibit, in the Pennsylvania Museum of Art in Harrisburg of his pieces. And I was privileged enough to have one of my pieces that I had actually purchased from him in the collection, uh, in the exhibit. So... Uh, so, so he was very unique in the way his art changed through the years, uh, and but, but it was more of his abstract work that became he had, uh, well known. He had a great influence on a number of students. Uh, Joe Savello, uh, who's still a living artist today, who went to the college here, well known. Ken Kuhn, uh, who did a lot of abstract work. He was on the faculty here, taught art. Um, and uh, he also went, uh, his, a lot of his work became more abstract, but uh, they always said, and Joe still says today, about the influence that Ed Zoller had on, uh, on them. So they, again, it was just part of that uniqueness of the faculty back then that it was special. He, he also joined the Army in 19, he was, he was in his 40s 
when uh, when World War II came yes. around, yep. yeah, yeah, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Corps of Engineers too. He had again, he his background was phenomenal. But then they they get they were so down to earth, you know, you wouldn't think. I mean, he loved having and he had a large studio, and he didn't mind people being there uh, as he was working, uh, which just was a total privilege to see somebody working like that or or be there one time and see a piece he started and being there sometime later and see the progression of that particular piece uh, so that that just really uh, was again so valuable to pe people and they would have a number of the students particularly the art students up to their own hundred springs uh, to visit with him and, and to see his work up there yeah very good so were the arts um was that an important thing on campus in general? Because you had the student exhibits, and you said you had the yeah. Beaux Arts. It was, yeah. and that's what was fortunate, particularly once the Smith Building uh, was right. Because we always had it was fortunately somebody always at least one person in art uh, on staff, art faculty. Uh, so, and there was a small, small gallery in Smith Building when it was built. Uh, that was right inside the one main door uh, that eventually became an office uh, because then art uh, was then more displayed in the lobby because uh, they needed a larger space so the, the art was working. And that's when the permanent art collection was established too to make sure that uh, we were doing the keeping of the, the pieces that would be cherished throughout the years. But So uh, being that we always had here, again, started in 58, theater, uh, and a faculty person involved in it, art with a faculty person involved. That, you know, helped with the overall education, I think. Uh, it strictly wasn't, you know, uh, engineering or whatever. So there was that great diversity that was provided by the faculty. And again, faculty that took their time to make sure that it happened. Uh, so... It, it it made it as I often say it made the difference, it really made the difference. So we we appreciated that very much, and and then every once in a while there'd be a professional if they were able to get a professional exhibit to come in to display, although not having the most proper facility to display it. Uh, but the big thing again was student uh, be once a year with student work, and then once we started having an arts festival, uh, that broadened that. Uh, concept a little bit more uh, to provide that opportunity for anybody, any student could submit something back in those days. So, you know, it was a, it really helped uh, even our little theater productions <laughs> were, uh, were something that, uh, oh, and then we had a foreign film series. Uh, Steve Adler, Dean, Dean Adler was big into foreign films. So for a number of years, it was a foreign film series. I think it was once a month on a Saturday. And he would select, uh, I think with a couple of people from the community, would select the foreign films. And there was a, uh, students were free, but it was open to the community for a fee. And there was a lot of community participation in it. Uh, so uh, we had, to, back in those days, even a foreign film series uh, that added to it the culture of our educational experience. So, what, what kind of films did you have? Because some of them can get pretty racy, you know what I mean? No, Dean Adler would not allow that. No, okay, okay. <laughs> he could come maybe to the edge, but he wouldn't. Okay, okay. <laughs> he wouldn't. Uh, and again, I think there's a lot, I know there's a lot in the archives. It would be interesting sometimes to even look at that series because they were always promoted. Uh, and I, I can vividly remember there would be articles in paper featuring the film that was coming up. Uh, but yeah, he was... And I'm not sure where his where his interest came for that. Uh, I don't remember anymore uh, if I ever knew where his interest was in foreign films, or whether he just thought it was something that would be unique and, and different here. So those went on for a number of years, actually, until Steve Dean Adler's passing. When, when did he pass? Oh uh, gosh, now I'm thinking because I became the acting dean of student affairs. I was on staff during my first tenure. And uh, so uh, he was uh, diagnosed with cancer. And uh, so when it got to the point he could no longer 
carry on its responsibilities, um, I was asked to then, to, in addition to my other activities, to be the acting dean uh, for, it was almost a year. That was an amazing experience, uh, truly was. Um, and also moved, I was asked then to move into the residence hall, the first residence hall, uh, in the staff apartment. There were two staff apartments. And that was a unique experience, uh, to say the least, uh, that we can talk about some other time. <laughs> but uh, so it, it was, was that there an oak? That would have been oak. Oh, first okay. residence hall, yes. Because again, back in those days, it was a house mother, and then there was also a male uh, uh, on the side because the building was one side was all male, one was all female. And there, do they ever touch? <laughs> <laughs> Back in those days, there were hours for the women. Uh, Penn State had hours for women back in those days. Uh, 11 o'clock at night and weekdays and 1 o'clock on weekends, unless it was a special weekend, like homecoming or something, 2 o'clock. We were allowed out to 2. Uh, men had no hours, so talk about, <laughs> talk about discrimination back then. <laughs> Nobody objected until they finally started objecting to why we have ours. So, and that, uh, I think, ended up when I was still here in my first tenure. But Steve was one of those who had everything up in his head. So, registration, uh, I panicked. Uh, we were ready to register for the fall, and I panicked. Fortunately, two assistants in his office uh, were great people who knew a lot, too. So, we got through it. Uh, a lot of a lot of concern, but we, we got through it. Uh, and then again, he passed away that during that year. But uh, and it was just a lot of wonderful memories of uh, that man and, and what he did. And again, uh, because of what he's done or did for athletics and students in general, is why the Adler Athletic Complex exists today and why it was named after, after him. So that was a fitting, very fitting tribute uh, to him. Were, were you sad to leave, or did you want to leave to go to, to University Park? We uh, were. Or we were sad to leave, because uh, we were having a great time here. We knew going to University Park, uh, you know, here, <laughs> how else can you put it, but we were something, you know. And then you go to University Park, which wasn't as large as it is today, but still, you were literally a number. Uh, and so uh, it was a good experience, uh, but it wasn't anything like we had here that we were involved. Um, so uh, if it could have been, if it could have been here for four years, I definitely would have been here for the four years, uh, just because um, you know you're getting a good Penn State education, but uh, it's a very personal uh, situation. So uh, we did. Uh, we did stay at University Park. A number of students commuted back and forth daily, uh, but most of us, when it was in our you know, inner group, we, we stayed at you know, we stayed at University Park. And junior year, we stayed in the residence hall because uh, that was about the the best thing to do at that point. There wasn't much downtown housing at that time at all. Very very little. In fact, when I went into graduate school, I had a tough time finding a place. Uh, off campus, uh, so so we did stay in the residence hall our junior year. Uh, well, what was your undergraduate in? Biological science. Biological science, which I've never touched since. <laughs> which which I guess happens, but well, my thought was I would teach, and I would teach biology or uh, or whatever. But I enjoy it. I've always enjoyed that uh, science, and uh, I still do today, although I've forgotten a lot. Uh, but it was a uh, it was a good good major. But I always had that flair, I guess, for the being the old days of the production manager side and the, the PR. And uh, so when Bob Wyka offered, you know, bye bye graduate school, <laughs> hello Penn State out to the <laughs> So back in those days, by the way, too, as a student here, uh, ROTC was mandatory. Uh, so, and it was, at the time we were here, it was Air Force was here, but it was mandatory. You didn't have a choice on that. 
so uh, we were all, all the men were in ROTC. So um, uh, my mother always took great pride in taking a picture of me in my ROTC Air Force uh, uniform. But uh, so we didn't, uh, back in those days, they were, because it was mandatory, they weren't as stupid as they are today as far as the drilling and, and uh, so forth. But, but today, most of them are in ROTC because they want to make a career of it. Uh, back in those days, well, it was just, it was mandatory. Did, did they end that? Yes. What? Oh, yeah. I'm not sure when the mandatory okay. ended. I don't think it was too long after we left here. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the other thing about it, too, is that... Um, Physical education, we didn't have any physical education, so um, that wasn't required either. Where at University Park, of course, phys ed was required, there's a certain number of courses, but the campuses where there were any facilities, there was uh, that wasn't required. Um, and I must confess that, uh, that as a student graduating from Penn State, you were supposed to pass a swimming test. Back in those days, University did not own a swimming pool. It was at a uh, business-owned swimming pool downtown State College, and you were to go there and, and take the test. And I must confess, a number of us never did it, but we still got our diploma. So, <laughs> so that was the one thing we just didn't bother doing. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. Oh, that's one of my think about. You know. What it was like, and not that terribly long ago. Yeah. Uh, and how many, how, how much has changed today? But they, they, again, I, I think going back to the hours for for women uh, was just unbelievable that that would happen. And what was interesting about that, and the time I lived in the staff apartment, uh, there were you have some very unique experience. Um, but when those doors would close and lock into the women's side. On the first floor, almost every night there'd be a couple guys sitting on the floor on the one side of the door talking to women on the other side of the door. And finally I had to say, okay guys, enough, you know. Uh, but yeah, so, but there were never, there were, there were never any problems. Uh, my biggest problem in living there was a water battle in the men's side one night, so. But that's another whole story. Uh, it was unique, <laughs> very unique. So we got through that one too. Is there um, is there something that you you would like to talk about that we haven't brought up or we don't have on our sheet? Well, I'm trying to think of since we're basically, although we have gone out in several other yeah. angles here, but uh, so I'm trying to think maybe of anything else for. Uh, my first two years here uh, uh -huh. that we haven't talked about that uh, other than again uh, seeing that the uh, we took advantage of a lot of different things like in the winter and of course they still do today but one of our only recreational activities would be when the ice was sticking up on the pond uh, to go ice skating uh, so that would be a uh, it was fact we too, we that became the theme of several of our social events, um, but they, the Beaux Arts Ball was uh, a big thing, and <laughs> we made a uh, a huge mannequin of uh, out of paper mache of a figure, a Greek figure, uh, all gray, that we used for the Beaux-Arts Ball as part of the decorations. Well, a group of us decided that the city needed some artwork. One of our buddies had a Volkswagen that had an open top. We were able to get this in it. And I think there's a photograph somewhere uh, of this sticking out the top of it, of the Beaux-Arts, or out of the Volkswagen. So one night we took it and we took it down and placed it in front of the doors of City Hall so that they would have some artwork. <laughs> we never heard anything about it after that, but <laughs> but we had fun doing it. Um, we have a picture of a couple of us holding this thing in front of the pond. Uh, but So it's somewhere. I don't know whether it's still in my collection or, or in the uh, archives. Uh, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, haven't yeah, seen I it. might still have that. Uh, 
but that was uh, uh, that was unique. We thought, well, let's just contribute this to the art of city of Altoona. Uh, so that's probably one of the worst things we ever did, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't anything destructive at all. So whatever the city did with it, we, we never did understand or find out why. Uh, but yeah, that, those were the things that, just to have a lot of fun, we... And I have a video, too, that we took um, that I think I need to get to the archives of a winter, winter day uh, with some of us kind of around out in the quad here, uh, which wasn't the quad then, but uh, so that would probably have to come in. But it was just those simple things, you know, particularly when you were sitting in the lobby of Smith Building. <laughs> okay, what are we going to do tonight? What are we going to do this weekend, you know? Not too much to do, and of course we weren't. We we're all undergrads, so we weren't of age to for, to go to a bar or to a club or anything. So again, we had to make our own. We had to make our own fun, in which, when you think back, I guess that's why I remember so much of it, and others do too, uh, because we had to make our own fun. It was unique and different that way. Yep. So, but that's basically what our two years was like here. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and uh, and we will the, the the next one will be your we'll start with your staff yeah. with your employee yeah. work in nineteen sixty three. Good, right. good. Thank you.